Welcome to Make Something With Me, David Picciuto, and today we are going to make some really high-end speakers. Check it. I've made a couple speakers in the past here on this channel, but they weren't high-end. They were more about looks and having fun. That changes today. This is a speaker kit from Creative Sound Solutions. If you look them up, the reviews on their speakers are phenomenal. They have three options when you buy their speakers. You can get the finished speaker, you can get the flat pack, which contains all the pieces for the cabinet that you glue together, or you can get what I got is just the components and we are going to build the cabinet. I'm not an audiophile and I'm definitely not an expert speaker builder. In fact, my hearing is pretty much shot from not wearing hearing protection while playing in bands for 20 some years. But I do have a deep passion for music, making it and listening to it. I am what you would refer to as a music snob. So whatever you listen to, I probably don't like. The funny thing is most of the music I listen to is pretty darn lo-fi. <laughs> I have a nice vintage receiver, I've got a high-end turntable, and it's time to add some high-end speakers to my mix. Many speaker builders will build their enclosures out of MDF or plywood. You can build it out of solid wood, but the solid wood will resonate a little bit more and requires a little bit more bracing, plus solid wood expands and contracts, and you don't want that tightening up over your drivers. CSS has the basic measurements for the cabinets on their website. I've modified them slightly to use rabbits. You can use butt joints, but the rabbits allow for you to get an airtight seal and just helps with the glue up. I thought about using butt joints. I even talked to Dan about using butt joints. And then we decided if we're going to go high end, we're going to go all out. So we got a lot of rabbits and dados to cut today. And just so you know, Camera Dan is an experienced speaker builder. So he's going to be fact checking me throughout the day. Thank you, Dan. If you're curious, I'm using the CSS Crichton 2TD kit. I have all of my measurements laid out. I'm going to group like measurements and cut all of those at the same time. That way I'm not moving the fence and then moving the fence back. So that's enough talking. Let's start cutting. So I have all of the pieces cut except for the front and back. We'll cut them later. If I hide the front, you can see on the inside there are vertical and horizontal support braces in there. And they are held in with these dados and rabbits. So that's the next thing we're going to cut is right there. I got a dado stack here. You could also do this at the router, but I really don't like the router. I also hate the dado stack, but I hate the router even more. It took quite a few tries to get the perfect thickness. There's a bunch of shims that you can put in there and we finally got it. So I'm just gonna start running these through, cutting my dados. I want to point out that is dangerous. The dado is already, first of all, the table saw can be very dangerous. And then it's even more dangerous when you put a dado stack in there because there's a lot more teeth, there's a lot more blade for kickback. Typically, when you use a fence, the board is longer this way and you ride up against the fence. If you need to cut something this way, you would typically use a sled because using the fence when the board is longer this way can be dangerous because it can wobble and if it wobbles, it's gonna kick back at you. I was using the fence. I kept that in mind. It is a dangerous cut. I'm an experienced table saw user, not an expert, just experienced. 
I know what I'm doing. I know the dangers. I just want you to be aware if you're new to the table saw, this might not be the way. You might want to use a sled instead, but everything came out just fine. So now I need to cut, uh, it, technically it's not a dado, it'll be a rabbit because it's along the edge. And so we're gonna do that next. Now that we have all of those cut, this is the right side. This is the horizontal brace. And the next thing I need to do is cut a little space for the tweeter because the tweeter is going to go right there. So I just need to notch out the centerpiece. So the next thing I need to do is work on these vertical braces. It's going to go right here. I cut them purposely too long so I can get the perfect fit because this is not going to go into a dado on the top and bottom. So I just want that to be flush with that. So I'm going to nibble away until I get the right fit for the top and the bottom. These vertical supports, I need to remove the center and I'm going to do that with a jigsaw. A trick so I don't cut into my workbench is just to throw down some of this purple pink. Is it purple or pink? Mm -hmm. Insulation and you can just cut right through it. So now it is time to glue this up. We already have one cabinet glued up as a test run before filming. And we're throwing a lot of glue in there for a lot of squeeze out. Definitely don't want air gaps because that's going to cause trouble with the sound. It's amazing how well that fits together. I'm not tightening these clamps down super tight just yet until I get longer clamps this way. So while these are drying, we'll work on the fronts and backs. We gotta, once again, cut the size and a few more rabbits and dados. Getting this centerpiece perfectly aligned with this center dado, a little difficult. It takes a couple of passes. And so I'm marking my line here and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the dado and then nudge my fence and make a second pass. And then this won't be as tight as all the other dados, but it'll be fine. <laughs> yes. So now it is time to cut the hole in the front for the woofers. This cabinet has two woofers, so I need to cut two holes if you if I'm doing the math correctly and I need to do a rabbit for this lip to sit on and then the hole for this to fall into and this needs to be flushed with the face of the cabinet otherwise you get it's, it's called diffraction it's called diffraction so things have to be kind of precise Dan showed me how to make this router jig and it's got a little pin in here this pin rides in this hole and then circles around so we're going to do our rabbit first because we need to do that uh, as step one and then we'll move the router in to make the hole hopefully that makes sense I'm not going to show you how I made the jig there are plenty of videos up on YouTube you can check that out that's a, that's an entirely different video otherwise just go ahead and use your CNC so now I actually have to move it in and do another pass to make that rabbit even bigger I've got that marked here as step two. So now that I have the rabbit cut, now I moved it to the next position and we're gonna cut all the way through, but it's gonna take a couple passes since this is three quarters inch thick. Oh. 
So now we're just going to just, just throw it right, right in the container. We have all of the holes cut for the speakers. You can see everything is flush mounted and everything fits really nice. It's already looking super sexy. So for the backs, we need to drill two holes for the two ports on each of the backs. I don't have a Forstner bit big enough for this. Once again, I could use the router and the circle jig, but I think this time I'm going to use the CNC. If you don't have a CNC, use a Forstner bit, use the router with the circle jig. This is a run what you brung situation. I got a CNC, I'm going to use it. Also not going to apologize. Sorry. That will eventually go in there like that. And then this goes over top of that. And then once you get to the right length, you can tape it or glue it into place. I'm going to pre-drill some holes for my crossover board before gluing this up. Cause that'll just make things a little bit easier. And I know I don't want to drill all the way through just deep enough. So when this is on the back, This will go in there. I'll be able to get a screwdriver in there and mount that on there. There are three holes in this one. Let me tell you why. Because I CNC'd one of the holes in the wrong spot. So I went back and I recut the proper one and I cut a plug for this one. It's all going to get covered up, so it's not a big deal. Um, just my air. I just I failed myself, Dan. I should have been right I, well, I failed you. I failed myself. I failed the audience. I failed CSS Audio. I failed my mom. All my teachers, especially my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Baker. And Jerry. I failed Jerry. What's up, Jerry? Now it is time to finally glue these guys together. We can start working on the crossover boards now. So it is time to wire up the crossover boards. I know absolutely nothing about electronics. I know nothing about speaker wiring and I'm terrible at soldering. And these crossover boards are made for somebody like me. So somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. All the boards are labeled. And basically there's only one place for everything. Like this can only go into its, its home. So I see that that label is the 8.2. This is, what is, what is this Dan? Capacitor. This is the 8.2 capacitor. And then the wires poke through the board like so. And then you can fold them over on the other side and then you can solder everything on the back of the boards. It's all numbered. This is a paint by numbers thing. So it's should be impossible to screw up as long as I paint by the numbers. So this goes in there like so. And then everything is just zip tied in there. easy as that. So now it's just time to solder everything together. Anything that comes out of hole D has to be soldered to anything else that comes out of hole D. So right now I'm doing A. If you want to critique my soldering technique, Instead of posting it in the comments below, just go ahead and shove that right up here. We have both of the crossover boards wired up. Dan did one and I did one. Dan's looks a little bit better, but wow. What did you call them? Cold joints? Yeah. yeah. I don't think we have any cold joints. Everything seems to look the way it should. And so we have the wires sticking out up top here and we can now 
start connecting our our stuffs. I know this wire to this woofer needs to be that long, but I want a little extra length so I can take the speaker out and set it down if I need to while working on this. I got the crossover board mounted on the inside and it's time to start putting this together. You can see you can change the size. They need to be a certain size. I got to look that up. I have a piece of yellow tape there to let me know the proper length, which this happens to be nine inches. So we stick that in there and I can stick this in there and then I can tape that length in place. There's way too much tape, Dan says, and it's gaffer's tape. So it's like $30 a foot. Also put our foam in there. You know what? Let's pre-drill. Let's pre-drill. Hey, Dan, is it okay if we do it the right way? I like how you backed up to not show the detail of my, my soldering work. I appreciate that a lot, Dan. I know what you're doing. I don't. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm not going to bore everybody by showing the drilling and screwing of every single screw. But on the back here, I have a temporary input wire coming out of the port. These binding posts are eventually going to get installed right here, but I'm not going to do that until I finish the speakers, skin in the outside, so for now, this is going to be my input. Those are heavy. That's it. So the last thing I need to do is take this in the house and see if they work. So there they are. I got them up and working. Turns out all my solder joints worked and they are sounding amazing. They sound so much better and different than the old 70s speakers down below. I'll do a little AB here, but uh, I'll set up a mic by the camera you can't really judge a speaker by a YouTube video and, and a microphone. You have to you have to hear them in person. The way I would explain the difference between the new ones and the old ones is the old ones are um, muddier in the in the bassy region it's not very defined uh, audio is such a hard thing to describe but uh, the, the the new ones they sound clear they sound beautiful really deep bass but not muddy like the old ones i know it might be disappointing to some of you right now but we are going to do a second video where we finish and skin them I do have somewhat of an idea of what I want. I know in that video, I'm going to make stands so they're not speakers sitting on top of other speakers. And I'm going to do a mix of materials. I don't wanna just throw on some wood veneer and call it done. I wanna get a little bit more fancy and a little bit more fun and something with a, with a good design aesthetic. So I do know that the faces are going to have removable grills. Audio purists like to have nothing blocking the speakers, but I want grills on there so they will be removable and I use some grill cloth. I might bring in some acrylic, I, something other than, than just plain wood. One of the challenges that I'm going to run into is the speakers have to be flush with the surface, otherwise you get diffraction. And so if I use a wood front on there, that means I've got to create a gasket to bring that speaker out a little bit so it's flush with that front. And then on the back, I did not add any of the binding posts just yet. So right now the speaker wires are coming right out of the port and it's just not something I wanna add right now. I wanna wait until they're finished. So there's still time before I make that second video. So if you have any ideas on what I can do to this, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear what you have to say because what I have in my head is not finalized just yet. There is a science to the speaker size and the materials used. I stuck with all the recommendations by CSS Audio. So the interior dimensions of these speakers are still to with the specs that they recommend. You can use plywood 
or MDF. They both have very similar densities. I have a high-end turntable. I have some high-end speakers. I'm thinking about getting a high-end amplifier and I don't know anything about amplifiers. So if you have any suggestions that doesn't include a $10,000 Macintosh stereo, let me know. I don't need the AM FM receiver part of the stereo. I just need something where I can switch between the record player and the cassette deck. Also down the road, I am going to make a new stand for everything here. This is just some Ikea furniture. I wanna make something where the records are up top here and there's little bins that you can flip through, at least the more common records that we play and then the rest can be stored down below. So that's down the road later on this year, but something of course, fancy and walnutty. I am aware of what can happen when the speakers are up against the wall or in the corner or when the tweeter is not at the perfect height. We are going to address those concerns in a future video. I did weigh one of these speakers. Each one weighs 32 pounds, so they're, they're quite hefty and meaty. I will have links to everything that I use, all the tools and supplies down below in the video description. That is gonna wrap it up. We'll see you soon with a brand new video. As always, be safe, have fun, stay passionate, and make something.